everyone. This is Angela Ye for, and we're here for another episode of Designing Futures. Our podcast is about the people in the industry of design, strategy, and innovation. People who have、um, grown up in this industry, people who have made their mark、um, supporting this industry, and just stories about what it's like to build careers. Um, and build this community. So I'm really excited today because I've got Sara De Silva here、um, with us today, and there's wow, so much history here for us, right?、Um, yeah, there is. And should we go back a long, long way? Don't yeah, we? Let's, I got well, my, let's, my, let's my... go right into it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I I got my start at YAID.、Uh, I was hired by you as an intern, wasn't I? All the way、yeah. back in the day. So many amazing people like you.、Um, so honored that I was just, you know, a step in your career.、Um, and but, you know, like honestly, I'm so impressed that people like you, who you know, who we've gotten the chance to work with, to watch you,、um, you know, just take your career to such amazing places. And I'm just really honored that today I get to tell your story, you know,、um, and how this all intertwined and evolved. Yeah, yeah, yeah.、What? No, definitely. I'm wait, excited. Wait. How long ago was that? When we that was a while. Do, do we date ourselves? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't know. I, th- I think it was probably around six years ago,、mm-hmm. maybe seven. Yeah.、Um, but yeah, I I started out as an industrial designer working in、uh, ID, you know, hardcore product design, and、yeah. I. I'm Australian, if you can tell by my voice. So I moved to America and and started working with YAID, and yeah, I just I noticed. I think I, lo- I learned a lot about the the design industry, the people working in the design industry,、um, people hiring talent, and what they really wanted from them. And then I, you know, started percolating in my own mind. You know, what did design mean for me? And I think it really started to mean making a big impact in the world that we face. Today in the future generations, so a lot of my work is centered around sustainability,、mm-hmm. um, and we also work very closely with materials、um, because, as a designer, I think that materials are very much the link from conception to end of life or、yeah. back to regeneration. So, yeah, that's the space that, well, that I've ended up in, I guess. Let, let's tell people really quick what you're doing now, just so that they, you know. But, It's like a movie, right? It's not necessarily chronological, but let's call them like, where are you now? And because I'm so impressed with what you've built. Yeah, the pronunciation is Hilo.、Um, the first part of the word is actually a, from an ancient Greek word meaning matter. So、um, we're, we're sort of very centered in materials, and last bit is oh, like we're very excited about materials,、um, and we really have a strong materials perspective. So I'm one of three female co-founders of this agency called Hilo,、um, and we're a global agency, so we、um, have talent、um, pretty much in every continent. And yeah, we、um, from sustainability to sociology to science, materials are at our core. And from the technical and the creative, we work with material manufacturers, brands,、um, sustainability, government, schools, just educating people about the qualities of materials and how and where to use them, so that we can have a more sustainable world, and you know, have all the products that we love to use and that excite us and. That are beautiful, quite frankly, because I'm a designer at heart.、Yeah. Um, but things that just have a bit more of、um, text and and、um, future foresight. Up, you know, what is that going to mean for our earth? We're not taking、yeah. too much. You you broke up there for a minute, so I I missed a little bit. You know, it caught up because. And by the way, for those of you guys who are listening,、um, Sarah's calling in, dialing in from Australia.、Um, thus. Your gorgeous accent, and by the way, I love your voice. People, whenever people call me, like, whose voice is that? <laughs> do you know you made me do the、yeah. uh, the dial in? <laughs> I had to do the dial in for yeah, I do. Yes. yes, when we had that, we switched to a different phone company, and we <laughs> had you do your gorgeous voice. But、um, when I think about the history of the design industry, I mean. Just in the amount of time that we, I've been in it, you've been in it. There was a phase where ten years ago, back then, color material finish 
wasn't even that valuable. I mean, I remember so many people who specialized in it and then companies losing interest in it saying, oh, we got enough collars, we're good, right? Then sustainability, yeah. um, ethical use materials comes in and now, and, and the technology that comes in here. I mean, color material, it's not even CMF anymore. It's more like CMD, color material design, right? Definitely. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more, I think back in the day material you sort of did the design and then you went and sort of stuck a material on top and thought well what yeah. should we make this from and now Spinning. that seems quite counterintuitive you sort yeah. of think we should maybe start with what's available or you know what what we have at our fingertips or mm -hmm. you know what is this product going to need to do it do we want it to last forever do we want it to last just five minutes to get to the consumer. So we really start at materials now. And I think a lot of designers and brands are starting to realize that they start with a material and then they they have a design that works with that. And they, they sort of have to be more creative. It, it's a little bit more of a challenge. Yeah. And the trends part of it, I mean, I think that, yeah, you're right. You used to just choose some colors based on some consumer personas, um, but it's, it's beyond that now, I think. Yeah. I mean, and, and to your point, color material finish back in the day in the life cycle of the design process, it was like, do everything, engineering, design, engineering. Oh, and at the last minute, skin it, right? Surface, yeah. right? And now, yeah. you are, I'm, I mean, I know, and I've talked to so many people and I would imagine, you know this more than I would, like they're starting, you're in the beginning of those conversations now, right? Definitely. And I think us having a very strong materials perspective is something that brands are starting to realize, wow, that's that's so interesting because they don't even know the possibilities. What these materials can do, mm. um, they're incredible. So you maybe don't need multiple parts or maybe you don't even need a surface because this has an incredible soft touch finish or things like that. So when we go into, we usually start at the ideation session with with the design team, with the innovation team, with the marketing team sometimes, um, and bring the material knowledge and get them excited and get them touching and feeling things. And then that process begins with the material in mind. So um, I, th I think that's the way that design is evolving. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope even to see brands and design agencies starting to develop their own materials that make sense for themselves. Wow, I love that idea. Now, when it comes to materials, I mean, I'm just so fascinated because it's amazing how this category has become a sub-industry in itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, my, I think the first inclination people think about is, oh, okay, materials, you know, first it's color and aesthetic sensibility. Um, then it's, you know, eco, green, but beyond that, it can be luxury. I mean, it can really be companies can really distinguish their brands, I would imagine. Definitely. And even when you think about being a circular brand or circular company, if you can take your waste and turn it into something else, that's really powerful. And you dramatically, you know, decrease your emissions or the impact that you're having. So even to think about things like packaging or um, things that are inside the corporate business paper and things like that, um, you know, what else can you do with them? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's amazing. And I would possibilities are, are endless. <laughs> the possibilities are endless. Does this come from corporations asking for it or do their consumers, do the, does their community ask for it? Or is it coming from the design community? I know having talked over so many years, talking to so many designers, waste, you know, mm -hmm. um, environmental waste is such an angst as a designer to know that the company they're working for or the work that they're doing is just causing more waste in that famous lecture, right? By who is a, a gentleman about environmental design and, and how he designed a toothbrush and he's on vacation and he sees the toothbrush he designed polluting the beach. Right? Yeah, we, we definitely as designers sort of design the product, get it on the shelves and then forget about it. Mm -hmm. So I also think another element of design is thinking about more the system and thinking about how can you design a system that keeps these materials at their highest value at all times so that they can stay in the loop. So um, yeah, thinking about design as not only just what does the consumer want, but what is the best for the system um, of 
of what we do and, and how we consume product and things like that. Um, and then also thinking of waste as a resource, I think is really exciting for designers. What is out there that already exists that you can transform and make mm -hmm. into something else. That's a great um, opportunity for us, I think. That's amazing. How long has um, Hilo been around? When did you establish it? We are four years old. I think this is our fifth year, technically. Yeah, five years old almost. Um, yeah, and we, we all were actually competitors, but we knew working in the materials space, a lot of companies will come to us and say, well, I want to use bamboo or I want to use cork or I want to yeah. use coconut fiber. And we would think, well, why? You know, <laughs> what's the point? Um, and we started to realize that there wasn't a lot of knowledge around materials and people wanted to be more sustainable, but they weren't mm -hmm. sure the best way to do it. So we found ourselves sourcing strange brown materials for people that we knew weren't going to be the solution. So we decided to start this agency. And our goal, firstly, is to educate people about materials and their role to play in a circular economy. Um, it's not just compostable materials, but it's also super durable materials, super lightweight, really technically sound materials that can work in sort of a reuse system as well, which is really important. And then we also help them tackle their challenges. So right now they've, they've got a plastic and it hits a certain price point and they need to stay within that. So what do we do? And that's something that we work on with them as well. Right. I think the old fashioned or way in the beginning, earlier phases of this industry of, you know, materials, science, um, they're not, there weren't that many choices and the costs were prohibitive, but there's so many options. There are, they, there's, in, and I think the pace of material innovation has increased rapidly. So it's hard to keep up as well. That's yeah. another thing for designers. That's another thing to do is keep up with the material innovation. Um, so it's, it's interesting. And I think a lot of the people we placed, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of the designers we placed didn't yeah. necessarily have this materials strong knowledge they were either really strong on sketching yeah. or CAD or they had a really innovative way of thinking but I <clears> noticed <throat> that there was a big gap in this material knowledge in the design well, industry and, I'm and curious if you feel the same absolutely the, I mean they who has time right I mean and each corporation to have their to collect and I we know so many companies that have attempted to collect their own library and corporations that are vast enough, have some kind of library, but this stuff is evolving so fast, right? Mm -hmm. So who's going to keep track of that? And better for them to go to an expert like you to say, what's going on? So we don't have to keep track of it. They can focus on their expertise of design, strategy, innovation, understanding their market. I mean, that, that in itself, there's just so much for them to do, let alone take care of this, right? And so it's great yeah. that you guys offer this service. Um, five years. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so second half of your business, you know, it's such a marker, by the way, to say when you get to your fi five year mark. And I just I remember when we got to five years and it was amazing. But <laughs> just to be able to say because that's that is one of the first markers as um, a small business. So your second half of your, you know, how long your company's been around been during the pandemic. How would you how'd you do during the pandemic? And then let alone, you had a baby. Talk about coming full circle. Because <laughs> let me just say, the, for all of you guys who are listening, I had Nico. And right at that point when I was pregnant with Nico, Sarah, it was you and Amory. And mm -hmm. um, you know, when you start a small business, you start with your expertise and what you know, then you realize it's time to grow this and it's time to bring on people who can understand and believe in the same mission, right? And at that mm -hmm. point, you and Amory King were the ones that were there for me. And um, yay ideology would not be here today if it weren't for you and Amory being there to kind of lead the charge for quite a few months while I was you know, like exhausted after having the baby. So I'm dying <laughs> to ask you how you do, you know, how you're doing with that. Well, first of all, that is so sweet of you to say. Um, yeah, I mean, we worked hard because we loved the brand and we loved the company. And I think um, I have to think back and a lot of my understanding of business and structure and work was formed by that experience and 
thinking, well, I could be a mom and I could do it all and I could have a business. And, you know, these little wheels turning that probably didn't mean much to me in the moment. But, you know, as I go through life, you know, that was an example that obviously I've, I've moved forward with and I, I know it's possible because I saw it. So thank you for the opportunity as well. Um, yeah, I mean, the company is set up to be this flexible thing. And, and I really think that that's the future workplace that women need to ask for and demand because mm -hmm. we have a lot to bring to the table. We're incredibly smart, intelligent people. And I think us missing from the conversation is maybe what's got us here so far. Um, so our company is really set up to have people in control of their workspace, work when they want to work, set their hours. We, you know, we work on a 24 hour clock almost. So it's, it's really flexible. And when COVID hit, I mean, that really showed us that decentralizing our business wasn't a bad idea. In fact, mm -hmm. a lot of other brands learned that they could do that too. So we work online, we work Zoom, um, we fly sometimes to meet clients for big projects or big moments in the project. Um, and that allowed me to, to have a baby and sort of be one foot in when I needed to be and and focus on on her and catch up on sleep when I could too. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and how old is she now? She's 16 months. Oh my God, beautiful. I know, it's oh, a nice age. What an amazing, yeah. what an, exp that is one of your biggest projects, <laughs> design projects. It is, it is, it is a big design project. And then I think it's motivated me more than I ever imagined. I'm, I'm wondering if this is the same for you with Nico. I, I had her and then I realized like there's so much work to be done, especially in the space that we work in. Um, so I'm more motivated than ever to, to work hard and um, mm. create some oh. successes. You're right. All of a sudden, I realized this perspective. I mean, all of this work that you're doing, I mean, this is for her generation. I mean, I think I, I think about it because I work in it every day and a lot of people don't because it's a lot to think about every day. But um, yeah, at the end of this, I'd like to look her in the eye and whatever solution or whatever happens in the future, she'll know that I, I've been working my ass off to make a difference. So that's all I can hope for. And I really think that if there's just more people out there who this is their intention, mm -hmm. we can make things change so quickly. And I think it starts with design. I really do. I, I'm so happy to talk to young designers and designers trying to push for change within big corporations because it can be exciting. It's just all about positioning. It can be a moneymaker. It's all yeah. about positioning. Absolutely. Framing. Um, yeah color material of design, this is a track, this is an industry. Are there conferences? Um, oh, and wait, and you have a book out now, right? If anybody wants to look about, learn about it, can they, I mean, or, or do you have a book coming out? We have a book coming out. We've finished the book, so it's very exciting. Um, it's a materials encyclopedia and yeah. we're publishing now. So it should be at the end of the year. We're hoping to launch it in Eindhoven. So it's a materials encyclopedia and it's the A to Z of materials and words I didn't even know existed. Um, it's been a labor of love from my co-founder, Elodie, for I think about eight years. And all of a sudden we've sort of pulled it together and it's gonna be an incredible resources for schools, for design corporations, just anyone who's interested in learning more about materials. This is a great place to start. Oh my God, this is gonna be a book that should be in every school. Um, any designer's education, every, any designer should have this book, right? Every corporation, every design studio. I think so. I think um, I think designers are naturally curious and mm -hmm. they, they want to learn and they want to keep growing. Um, and this book is, yeah, really designed, not even just materials, but processes as well. Um, so to just to know the lay of the land, really understand things, and then you can think about what's innovative in materials and what's changing because you've got a great base knowledge. Nice. Processes what for like if you're designing something electrical or plastics or like soft goods, hard goods, soft goods, what are we talking about when you talk about processes? Yeah, both. Um, it could be injection molding or, yeah, I don't know, painting in different ways, um, blow molding. Yeah, we sort of go through the gamut of all the different types of processes that materials can go through to transform. Oh, absolutely. Uh, 
an essential educational book for designers. I yeah. love it. Um, how many materials are there now? I mean, well, when we say how many materials, there's a zillion. I mean, I don't it's know what amazing. number, but like, how do you categorize? Are there, you know, is there, I don't know, unconventional material? Are, are there categories to this? So, I mean, for the book, we really just do the A to Z, but I think in, um, in our work, we sort of just look at it from the big buckets, like yeah. plastics, textiles, mm -hmm. um, you know, wooden paper, uh, cellulose. Um, so it's sort of grouped in that way. And then within each of those buckets, there's sort of a million other buckets that things get more granular okay. um, and I think as designers we've known the big buckets am I going to use plastic or am I going to use metal or am I going to use wood but then once you get in a little bit deeper it's like well am I going to use a bio-based plastic or am I going to use a recycled PET plastic or am I going to use a virgin plastic um, so there's a number of different types once you even just get into it. So we really like to start from what does this product need to do? Who is it for? What's the context? How long does it need to live for? Because I'm, I'm personally not super against plastic. I'm against single use plastic and I'm against the context mm -hmm. that we have it in right now. Mm -hmm. But I think plastics enabled a lot of the modern life that we see here. Yeah. So to get rid of it in medical applications or things like that, it seems like it's not the best way to start. Um, so really what we're really excited about personally, I'm really excited about is bio-based materials. Mm. So that's things like cellulose from mm. a tree. Um, and, you know, what else can you do with that? There's lignin, which is the natural binder in a tree. So the natural glue, what else can we do with that? Um, so things like that, I think, are really, really interesting. Um, recycled materials, sure, but let's yeah. get to a point where that we don't have many recycled plastics because we've cut single-use plastics. So we're sort of planning for the world that exists after that. Right. I'm just curious, like, who who's out there inventing new materials? And is there an industry or uh, a, that specializes in all the waste that's being created today and is there a business there or an, different opportunities for people to experiment with that i mean that's not your space necessarily but you're looking i mean you must i don't know if you're in touch with these people where i've invented this and they come to you and they and you say mm, is that useful or not like do you talk to them so we sit between those two groups we call ourselves translators and we sit between the material manufacturers that are really technical. They're talking about the composition of a material from a scientific perspective. And then we talk to brands and designers who are talking about a material in the perspective of what can it do and what is the consumer going to think about it when they touch it. So those two are very different languages and not many people, I feel, bridge both. Um, and that's what we do we have a lot of scientists on staff we have people inventing materials on staff and we have close connections with material manufacturers who are constantly innovating in, within their space and then we're keeping our eyes open for the young students who are coming up with fruit peel leather or they're creating bricks from paper and we keep touch with these interesting people and these interesting things that don't necessarily have scale yet but maybe if we had a corporation who was interested, we could say, let's pair you with you. You need the money, you need the, you know, you need the innovation and work together. Oh, I love it. The connecting. Maybe that's what I got from you, Ange, the connecting. <laughs> and the world needs people who can connect. It's like find the divide and make that and bridge the gap. I love it. Um, you were mentioning some, you gave some examples of some interesting materials. Can you give me something, some like what's new that people didn't expect? Did you say some like invent banana peel something, you know? Yeah. Well, color change is, is really interesting. So we, we've recently done a research into invisible materials. So that means a lot of different things, but we found some really interesting innovation in color change or um, color shifting materials. So that I think has um, some interesting applications that we can think about in terms of personalization and customization without having to produce, you know, 
five different types of colors. Yeah. Um, and then also, you know, these invisible binders and glues, they're not really sexy, but we've got some interesting stuff coming out of like sticky rice binders. Um, so things that are really natural and you think like glue adhesive, you think, you know, the nasty stuff, the chemicals. Oh, no way. There's some really interesting bio-based glues that are coming from like sticky rice and things like that. Um, I have. I yeah. Have... Algae is interesting. Algae. Oh my God. Wait, can I tell you when I was young, um, my mom was very, very resourceful and we, she would have envelopes that were old and the adhesive on the envelopes would, would uh, evaporate, right? Lose their stickiness. So she would take sticky rice, like really well cooked mm -hmm. rice and real, and let, she would rub it along the edge of the envelope seam. And that would be the seam to close up the envelope. And, and that's, a, that's amazing. That's hysterical. There you go. It's, it's Some amazing. of the... Um, the Great Wall of China is held up by sticky rice glue. No, no, no. Really? Get out of here. Yeah. Sticky rice. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Some, some parts of it now. Yeah, some parts of it now. The adhesive is sticky rice glue. So another thing we're really interested in is looking back into ancient materials and processes because there's a lot there that we just haven't learned about. Um, yeah. Your mom, my grandmother, some of the most sustainable people probably in the world. We're looking at natural materials, bio-based materials. There's a lot of future alternatives and a lot of them now are being developed in a way that they can, they can replace the materials that we work with and live with now. Um, and graphene is another material that I am super excited about. Um, I think it's got a lot of potential in um, innovation for us and um, I, I keep my eyes very closely on what's happening in graphene um, and I mean if you're interested in materials and you want to know what's going on there are a lot of these panel discussions there are a lot of um, sort of events that you can listen to material manufacturers mm -hmm. um, there's there are places for you to go to um, to hear what's happening and to hear what people are um, working on for sure. Excellent. Um, would you, I guess, how do people find that if designers want to know about that, right? About that space a bit more? Are there certain conferences or I could see you speaking at one of these? You know. We do do speaking engagements. Yes. Um, and then we also host panels often of different material manufacturers. Mm. I think the design week in Eindhoven is one of the better um sort of places to see material innovation. Um, I think that they do a great job of teaching their students to experiment with materials. So um, usually the outcomes and the exhibits there are really material centric. Um, and then, you know, there are databases. Uh, Materio is a, is a library, material library that we work with in France. Um, so they just, yeah, have a library of, of innovative materials that you can go and visit and touch and feel. I'm sure there's a material library near you wherever you live. Um, so that's another thing you can do is just, just get around materials, start touching and feeling, start seeing what you're interested in. Mm -hmm. And then um, you'll be able to sort of research depending on, on what inspires you or what makes sense for your brand of design. I love it. I love this. Thank you so much be, for being such a wealth of knowledge on this in this new product. Well, I, I feel like it's new, but it's not new, but it's progressing and evolving, you know, with more um, science and technology around building, giving us new options. Um, I'm curious, you know, you, you know, material sciences or materials in general, what industry needs more or needs more innovation or, or, or which one on the, in, on the other side of the um, question, what industry is advancing in really using new materials more? Mm -hmm. I think uh, in terms of the industry that has the potential to make the greatest impact by changing their materials, mm -hmm. it would be the fast fashion or the fashion industry. Um, they're one of the greatest contributors to, to the, the planetary concerns that we have right now. Um, so I think that hemp is going to be really exciting for clothing. 
um, and not like the crunchy, you know, Hessian bag hemp that you probably think of, but like luxurious, silky kind of feeling hemp. Um, so I'm excited to see what our clothes are going to be made out of. Mm. Um, also processes like 3D knitting. Um, that's something that can be done by a machine, um, can be customized in terms of sizing and things like that. And we can do localized manufacturing as well. So I think those sort of ideas and concepts around fashion could be really interesting rather than the processes that we have now. Um, and then the areas that I'm seeing a lot of innovation happening, probably honestly is packaging. <laughs> I think that everyone's having a, a packaging crisis at the moment. Mm. And also it's one of the industries that is now being um, sort of dictated to by government. So we're seeing more laws come in about extended producer responsibility, which essentially means if you put packaging out into the the you know the universe you mm. must be able to take it back or um the the consumer must be able to get rid of it so it's essentially your responsibility right up into the end so a lot of companies are now trying to figure out what's their approach to packaging do they have a, a circular system where things are reused like um i don't know if you've heard of TerraCycles loop yeah they've been around <laughs> aren't they wait aren't they in new jersey do i know the founder you probably do, Ange. I mean, they yeah. have been, TerraCycle's been around for ages and they yes. launched this loop system, which essentially means, you know, you get your deodorant, you get your face wash in the packaging and you essentially send it back and then you, yeah. you know, that refill system happens. So that's really exciting. And then also packaging that is completely degradable, is regenerative, 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 mm. <laughs> sorry, I can't say the word today, <laughs> back into the earth. Um, you know, things that are compostable and, you know, don't harm the environment. Better yet, add to the soil, you know, have some seeds for flowers or mm -hmm. um, things like that. So I think that that's really interesting. We are working with slash investing in a, a small company in Sweden that is uh, working on advanced cellulose materials and mm -hmm. they are designed to replace fiberglass. So if you think about... Um, you know, applications in uh, transport or accessories, helmets, um, scooters, things that, you know, need some strength and weight, we can actually make out of paper. So that's also really exciting as well. I think the automotive industry is very open to new materials um, and we're starting to see them play with some of these, these things and, and figure out how to integrate them. Wow, absolutely fascinating. You know, your comment about how in the packaging industry, um, so much investment uh, is going into coming up with alternative materials because of mm -hmm. government. And yeah, I hate to say it. I mean, like there is an example of where government comes in and that's really doing a favor to encourage companies to do something the right way, you know, um, yeah. pushed by, by community and people. I mean, in the end, it's people that push for this, right? Exactly. So, you know, as, as a brand, as someone working as a brand, if, you know, you're listening to this and you're a designer, you can, you can make the choice to be proactive and make these changes and do it now, or you can wait for these, these legislation pieces to come in and then try and sca scramble and, and catch up. So mm -hmm. that's often a conversation we're having with these brands is, this is coming, it's it's inevitable. And you can either be ahead of the curve or you can try and play catch up. Um, so if you start now, you may not be making great changes or, or huge changes, but there are small things and you're wrapping your head around what it means for your business and you're, you're doing some things that when it gets to the point where we do have these laws in place, you'll be able to adjust, your business will be able to adjust. And um, that's something I think that gets left out of the conversation very regularly is not all companies we deal with now are future proof. Um, mm. A lot of them won't, won't stand this test. And let's well, hope there's more laws. I mean, maybe that's just me, but I'm hoping that we see it a lot in Europe. We're starting to see it in um, America. I think Maine was the first um, area to instate the law. Um, I haven't seen it in Australia yet, but I'm, I'm hoping to see it. So many designers, you know, at all the conferences that I've gone to and all the professionals I speak to in every 
sector of design, uh, waste, environmental waste is such an angst. Um, I think back to our design summit from 2021 and T. Chang talked about design activism. You know, as a designer, you know, there are so many designers that work in companies where maybe the company's mandate says, no, just make us something really quick. Um, and it may not be something that the corporation asks of you, but is that, but this is something I feel like designers and to what you're saying, Sarah, it's our prerogative as creatives to, to take the time, extra time to understand material sciences and materials, the options, right? The alternatives mm -hmm. and to encourage the management in the company to look at this. Because, you know, in the end, this is for our future. It's for our kids. It's for, it's for this planet that we live on, right? Absolutely. And, you know, if the eco-anxiety isn't enough to get you moving off your chair, something to think about and throw out in a conversation with your boss is the circular economy is a lucrative industry. It's an industry worth about $4.5 trillion. So if you think about it like that, it's really, again, all about framing. So what's the value proposition about being more sustainable? Mm -hmm. You likely get to control your material flow and make sure that you can have secure supply chains and, and be in control of creating your product and taking it back. Um, but also, you know, consumers are going to start advocating and being activists with their wallet. So they, we know that consumers want to buy for brand, from brands that have and communicate about the environmental and social changes um, that they're making as a company. Um, so reporting on this is really important for a brand to do. Um, mm. So, you know, if, if you go into your boss and say, I'd like to change this design or I'd like to use this new material and it's going to be a little bit more, also come in with the value proposition of that, you know, maybe more consumers will be um, inclined to reach for it off shelf because it looks different and it, and you can show that it's having an impact. Um, yeah, I, I, I think there's some interesting ways and be creative about it and, and design the whole system. Don't just design a product, you know, really design the whole system, I think is the, the takeaway for designers anyway. I love this. I love this. Thank you so much for inspiring us um, and playing your role in this whole ecosystem of design, right? Um, you, you know, I know that there are companies that a lot of companies are kind of, is it greenwashing? You know, just to yeah. do a little bit, just to get the gain that market share, because you're right, Matt, con the consumer, just the world. So many consumers are, you know, choosing and selecting and deciding with their wallets. What brands are out there that are impressive that you've always, you know, that you're seeing, uh, whether they've been doing it for a while or new companies that are coming in? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right 100% about greenwashing being a really big issue and a really big challenge because it adds another layer of complexity because there's so much misinformation out there about what is sustainable and what is not. Um, if you are caring about this and, and wanting to buy from a brand who is making the right steps, go and have a look at their sustainability page. They should have one on their website and it should be quite a robust offering. Um, if you hear the word eco, green, forget about it. it it's not anything. Um, one of the examples I can point you to that I personally think does an incredible job a little bit left of field, probably not uh, what you would, probably not the answer you were expecting, Ange, but the Coldplay website. What? They, yeah, they are um, producing shows that have an environmental conscience mm -hmm. and they're reporting on the waste, the water use, the electricity use. Um, they talk about all the innovations that they have um, for you know to, to make sure that they have an, a less of an impact or their shows have less of an impact and they report out very clear data very understandable so if you're unsure like what a sustainability website should look like or what a, a page should look like I'd steer you there first so you know that 
if a brand is claiming to be sustainable and they don't give you this level of information, then they're probably greenwashing you. Um, another brand, uh, consumer brand, is Reformation. They're a fashion brand. Um, their reporting is really good. Um, go online, have a look at their sustainability reports, have a look at their website. Um, they do a really great job at reporting out um, what materials they're using and, and all that kind of stuff and what sort of savings you can you can have. Reformation. Um, I love it. I yeah. will definitely check out Reformation. And Coldplay? No way. This is amazing. I love it. Love their music. Yeah. And I love that they're taking their you know, exposure, I mean, the recognition to, for a cause that they believe in. That's excellent. Definitely. When, when am I going to see you interviewing them? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, I'll just be happy to go to the concert. Maybe I'll just get, <laughs> get a ticket to go. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's the thing. Sustainability touches everyone. You don't have to be producing a product or, you know, you don't have to be producing physical things. It's, it's an intention. It's, um, it's mm. the way you do things. So I think even if you're a, a band, um, what you do, you can do more sustainably. And I think they're showing a lot of people, uh, yeah, the way to do it. So, yeah, I like Coldplay for more than one reason now. What other celebrities or high-profile people are out there? That are, are there others or is Coldplay kind of an anomaly? I mean, there are definitely celebrities who are throwing their weight behind this. I know that Leonardo DiCaprio, um, probably more behind the scenes, is is doing a lot of work um, to figure out renewable energy and things like that. Um, and it, it is a bit of a catch-22 because a lot of times celebrities are getting involved in this, but they're getting involved in a way that, that it's somewhat greenwashing. Um, so mm -hmm. it's a little bit difficult. You know, if you you see some things on Instagram, you know, and it's a mushroom something or other and some celebrities put their name on it, you know, it's a feel good story, but is it really making, making an impact? So again, I think that if there's someone out there who's doing the work and, and having results, they'll be reporting it. They will have data. They will have a report. And I just, you know, implore people to just go and have a look at those things. You may not understand them at the start, um, but I think consumers are just so incredibly in touch with, you know, the things around them um, that, that they are. They're going to give the time to this. They do their research. They know about brands that they can trust and that sort of align with their, their mantras and their feelings, and mm. then they're going to stick to them. And brand loyalty is going to be a completely different beast for us to navigate. We, we do that a lot. We help brands with their sustainability reporting, um, and we're very much advocates for full transparency. Um, so that's the only advice I can give in, in that space is, is be transparent and, and build trust with your consumer. Yeah, watching what's happened in the last two years of the entire world, right? All of us realizing mm -hmm. that we are all connected. We are all part of a larger cycle and what we're creating, what we're leaving behind that, what we, that trash that we leave behind is coming right back at us. And mm -hmm. uh, to just realize that we are all part. Yeah. We're all, you know, what we throw and leave on mother earth affects us. Sarah, this was, uh, you know, I just was so excited to catch up with you to see what you're doing and you've really educated us um really appreciate this thank you for inspiring us and, and telling us so much about what we can do and um you know what's going on in this space well thanks Ange. thanks for the opportunity and i mean you've always been a, a big cheerleader in my corner so i i always thank you for that and yeah i mean i think you're doing what you do really well um bringing people together, having interesting conversations, connecting them um, and sort of moving design into the, the future. And I think, um, yeah, it's really important work that you're doing as well. So thank you for having me. And um, yeah, I hope that this conversation evolves in many different ways and, and we can make some real change and inspire people to, to do some different things. If you're interested in learning more about Hilo, you can obviously go to our website. It's www.hyloh.com. Um, you can follow us on Instagram. 
Uh, we post a lot of educational content, inspiring content there, or you could just reach out. Uh, my email address is Sarah at Hilo. Um, so if you're someone working in the materials industry or a designer who'd like some advice, feel free to email me. Um, very happy to, to support and help in, in any way we can, obviously. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I guess that wraps up this episode of Designing Futures and talk about, you know, designing the future, right, for the better. Sarah uh, really brought a wonderful perspective to this. Wow, this world is going to, this is going to be such, I can, I can only imagine how many designers could learn so much from this conversation um, and the resources. And by the way, uh, the resources that Sarah has shared, you know, you'll find them in the link below and on our website. Um, if anybody wants to learn a little, anything more about this, well, obviously you can reach out to Sarah. Thank you guys for listening in. And it's been an absolute pleasure to introduce you to someone else that we know that has been, you know, such a beautiful piece of this community. 